Welcome to the Inside the Board Study Smarter series dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed on your exam. Hello, and welcome to the Inside the Board Step 1 Study Smarter series. My name is Stuart Bryant, and I'm your host today. I'm going to be doing a few embryology questions for a question to section from our embryology week. I'm going to go ahead and apologize. Uh, This past week, I was under the weather a little bit and unable to record this as planned. But given that, I am still going to get this out to you uh, this week, and hopefully this weekend have a question dissection from our practice question rounds uh, powered by stat pearls. After that, we'll resume our content plan, and next week our plan will be to release episodes on the topic of pharmacology. Uh, So today we'll review a couple of embryology questions and cover those concepts, and that'll wrap up our embryology week. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you enjoy this episode. So to get us started, we have a 27-year-old female who presents with concerns of hypercalcemia. Radionucleotide scanning reveals an area of increased uptake in the posterior inferior aspect of the left thyroid lobe. Which of the following is the embryologic origin of the most likely involved structure? Is it A, the ventral wing of the third pharyngeal pouch? B, the dorsal wing of the third pharyngeal pouch? C, the ventral wing of the fourth pharyngeal pouch? Or is it D, the dorsal wing of the fourth pharyngeal pouch? So this question is asking you to identify pharyngeal pouches, and it's given you the option between the third and the fourth pouch, and then it also is making you pick between the dorsal and ventral sides. So this patient has a concern for hypercalcemia. So the hormones that we're going to be thinking about for calcium are going to be, in particular here, parathyroid hormone. Um, Parathyroid hormone being released will increase the amount of calcium being resorbed from bone and introduced into the bloodstream, raising serum calcium, potentially causing hypercalcemia if there is a a tumor or some sort of primary hyperparathyroidism. So if you know that the parathyroid gland is a origin of the third or fourth pharyngeal pouch, it's going to be really helpful for you here. So the question then here becomes, which of the following is the pharyngeal pouch that we're interested in for the posterior inferior aspect of the thyroid lobe? So we're assuming it's the inferior parathyroid gland, and that's going to be uh, either the third or fourth. So knowing that the parathyroid glands originate from the dorsal wings of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches, removes the ventral wings as options. And then knowing that the inferior aspects come from the third pouch and the superior uh, come from the fourth pouch is going to be key to answering this question. This makes the answer choice B, the dorsal wing of the third pharyngeal pouch, the correct answer. To kind of go through their explanation here, The parathyroid gland, it originates from the dorsal wings of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches. The parathyroid glands are located on the dorsal aspects of the thyroid gland. The superior parathyroid glands originate from the dorsal wing of the fourth pharyngeal pouch, while the inferior parathyroids originate from the dorsal wings of the third pharyngeal pouch. The ventral wing of the third pharyngeal pouch develops later into the thymus, The ventral wing of the fourth pharyngeal pouch will ultimately develop into parafollicular C cells of the thyroid. The next question is a two-year-old male who presents to the pediatrician with his mother for assessment. She states that he has occasional bloody stained diapers and is concerned they are becoming more frequent. The physical exam is unremarkable. 
Which of the following is a persistent remnant of the yolk stalk, also known as the umphalomesenteric duct? Is it A, the umbilical vein, B, the Meckel's diverticulum, C, the appendix, or is it D, the umbilical artery? So this question is talking about a two-year-old who comes in and is having bloody stools. Occasionally, they don't seem to be in any duress. They are otherwise normal. And they're asking you, where would this blood be coming from? So you have a couple of options in a child with blood-stained stools. Now, note that this is not bloody diarrhea, which would put you on a different path as well. If this did become bad enough, it could turn into diarrhea, but to make it more benign and to kind of focus more on your anatomy here to get at the yolk stalk remnant that it's going for, uh, they might just say it's blood stained or there were specks of blood in it. So the answer choice B is the correct one, Meckel's diverticulum. Uh, that's your remnant of the yolk stalk or the umphalomesenteric duct. Uh, it's a good one to know both names of because they, they like to test you on uh, one or the other, and sometimes can trip you up if you haven't learned the synonyms. Again, that's always a great strategy for the boards, is to know the synonyms of uh, basic terminology, or in particular buzzword terminology, because that's how they like to test your ability to recognize things. So there are a couple of rules for the Meckel's diverticulum, and it's the rule of twos. It most likely occurs in two-year-olds, it's seen in 2% of the population. Uh, you find it 2 feet from the terminal ilium. 2% of these are symptomatic. Males are twice as likely to get it. The diverticulum is roughly 2 inches long or less. It can be up to two types of mucosal linings in it. Uh, it often contains ectopic gastric or occasionally pancreatic tissue. Uh, which can be the cause of the bleeding. It is found more commonly in males, as I said. The male to female ratio, I said, is twice as likely, but it could be up to three times uh, for symptomatic patients and in the pediatric population in general. A 16-year-old girl presents to her primary care provider because she has not started and sees yet. Physical examination shows facial hair and coarse pubic hair. Pelvic exam demonstrates clitoromegaly. Ultrasound of the abdomen does not visualize a uterus or ovaries, but does note inguinal testes. Which of the following is true regarding this patient's development? Is it A, her inguinal testes are not secreting testosterone? B, dihydrotestosterone production in this patient is normal? C, this patient's karyotype is 46XY. Or is it D? There is a mutation in the MIF gene. So this patient appears to be female, but she does not have a uterus and has clitoromegaly, and they find inguinal testes with the ultrasound. So without even thinking about any more into this question, I see that they have testes and they have clitoromegaly and they don't have a uterus. So I'm pretty sure that this patient is going to be a 46XY patient. So the correct answer is going to be C. However, that's just a heuristical way of thinking um, that I, when I see these questions and you will see these questions on your test, I, I can't guarantee it, but the way these questions are written, they're trying to stump you on this whole pathway of, I guess, sexual development. Knowing the different hormones and hormone pathways, the embryology and the endocrinology of this uh, can really go a uh, far away for helping you uh, get points. To kind of go through these answer choices, um, her inguinal testes are not secreting testosterone. It's likely false. Um, this patient has clitoromegaly, coarse pubic hair, has facial hair, so they probably are having sexual hormones being produced. 
that's most likely going to be testosterone, uh, which is produced from the testes. Dihydrotestosterone production is normal. If this is the disease that I'm thinking of, it's probably going to be low, and I'll get to that in a second. And the last answer choice is there is a mutation in the MIF gene. Uh, that's Mullerian inhibiting factor. With normal Mullerian inhibiting factor, uh, you'll get regression of the uterus, uh, fallopian tubes, uh, the upper third of the vagina, etc. And since this patient does not have a uterus or ovaries or a fallopian tube, I'm assuming that the MIF gene is actually working normally. So what does this patient have? This patient likely has a mutation in the 5-alpha reductase enzyme, um, which is important for converting testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. With a mutation in it, you will have very low levels of dihydrotestosterone, uh, which is why I think answer choice B would be wrong. This patient would still be XY. Uh, they would be male with characteristics, but because of that lack of hormone, uh, they would not develop external genitalia um, like a normal male would. So a couple of things. Like I said, the malaria inhibitory factor is probably normal, which allowed for regression of their uh, internal genitalia. Um, the dihydrotestosterone is low because of the 5-alpha reductase deficiency. And without dihydrotestosterone, the patient's not going to develop a scrotum or penis or external genitalia. They may have clitoromegaly. And with the testosterone, they'll have clitoromegaly, the coarse facial hair, uh, the sexual development um, that we, you would see here. The patient also has testes instead of ovaries, and that's because their Y chromosome has their um, it's the SRY gene, which is, I think, the sex-determining region gene, uh, which determines that they get testes in this patient. So all things considered, you're seeing a patient that has facial hair, uh, sexual development, clitoromegaly, does not have a uterus and does have testes, you're going to think, oh, this patient's carrier type is 46XY. And that's going to be the answer choice C here. The next question is, a G1P0 presents for prenatal ultrasound. During the procedure, color Doppler of the cord demonstrates two vessels with toward flow and one vessel with away flow. The clinician states that this is normal anatomy. Which of the following is the role of the umbilical arteries? Is it A, to carry oxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus? B, to carry deoxygenated blood from the fetus to the placenta? C, to nourish the placenta with oxygenated blood? Or is it D, to take deoxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus? So this question is talking about a color Doppler and is a little clinical. Maybe you get some radiology um, basics in your uh, preclinical training, but it's probably not a big part. Anyway, color Doppler looks at basically ultrasound is measuring whether or not something is flowing towards the Doppler or away from the Doppler, and that colors it either blue or shades of blue or shades of red based on which direction it's going. In this patient, they show that the cord um, has three vessels, two coming toward the, the Doppler and one flowing away from the Doppler. And that's going to set up your regular anatomy for two arteries and one vein. In this case, then it's asking you what the role of the umbilical arteries is. And you have to kind of do a, a reversal in this case because the, the umbilical arteries are actually a little different uh, than what you normally think of as arteries doing. Um, but at the end of the day, it kind of makes sense uh, based on how they work. So arteries are pumping the blood away from the fetus. Uh, in this case, a fetus is trying to send off their deoxygenated blood 
to mom who's able to breathe and can respire and get rid of their CO2 and blood product, waste products. And then the vein of the, the umbilical vein is going to bring oxygenated blood back to the fetus uh, from the placenta. So because of that, this gets a little bit confusing. And ultimately, the answer choice here is going to be B, to carry deoxygenated blood from the fetus to the placenta. Uh, the purpose of carrying oxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus is answer choice A, which is the, the role of the umbilical vein. Answer choice C, nourish the placenta with oxygenated blood is kind of kind of doesn't make sense, but that would probably fall under the chorionic villi or chorionic vessels that would do that. Uh, and then D is to take deoxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus. And that just in no way makes sense to take blood without oxygen from the mom who's capable of respiration uh, and sending it to the fetus in a deoxygenated form because the, the baby cannot use the deoxygenated blood. It's, it's not helpful for the fetus. It needs oxygenated blood in order to uh, continue having aerobic metabolism. The teaching points from this are that the umbilical arteries deliver deoxygenated blood to the placenta from the fetus, and in the fetus, the umbilical arteries encircle the urinary bladder. They transport deoxygenated blood from the fetus to the placenta through the umbilical cord. The two umbilical vessels combine with each other about three to five millimeters from the insertion of the cord. This type of vascular connection is referred to as a hurdle anastomosis. And then once in the placenta, the umbilical arteries divide into small branches known as the chorionic vessels. The next question here is a G1P0 patient presents for a new OB visit. Her last day of menstrual period was six weeks ago. On ultrasound, a single gestational sac and two separate yolk sacs are visualized. When did the zygote separate? Is it A, four to five days, B, one to four days, C, eight to 13 days, or is it D, 13 to 15 days? This is a tough question because it's wanting you to identify uh, what kind of pregnancy this is and then know based on that type of pregnancy what is the time frame that the zygote must have divided in order for it to have this current state. So it has one gestational sac and two yolk sacs. Uh, that makes it monochorionic, uh, one gestational sac and diamnionic, or two yolk sacs. So the way I like to think about it is you can kind of base it on the chronological order of how these different pregnancies would come about. So the earliest separation of pregnancy is going to create a dichorionic, diamnionic pregnancy, and that's going to be the first separation. That's typically going to occur between one and four days, uh, after fertilization, each fetus has its own sex. Uh, this differs from a monochorionic diamnionic, uh, which has just the, the one sac and two yolk sacs. So I think of that one as the first one because it can occur from one to four days. Then after that, there's the monochorionic diamnionic pregnancy where it's occurred after four days. Uh, between four and five days typically, and this creates a, a single chorionic sac, but two amniotic sacs. Here you would see trophoblasts forming a single placenta. Then the next one occurs between eight and 13 days, and that's going to cause a monochorionic, monoamnionic pregnancy. Those fetuses will share a single chorionic sac a single amnionic sac and a single yolk sac. Uh, they're basically sharing everything. Unlike the monochorionic diamnionic pregnancies um, where they have, you know, two separate chorionic sacs. 
The last option here was answer choice D, which was between 13 and 15 days. And that's actually fairly late after fertilization. And because of that, um, you're going to expect there to be some pretty significant differentiation of already occurred in a zygote. In that case, there are specific organ structures developing and so on. And that's going to cause a, a split to really create a, a conjoining of the, the zygotes or the twins to be conjoined. This late change differs because before when it's monochorionic and, and mo diamnionic, nothing else has really formed. Uh, so the, the embryos will be separated. A two-week-old baby has been constipated since birth, passing only small stools. Vomiting, occasionally bile-stained, started in the first week of life and is becoming increasingly more severe. On examination, there is definite abdominal distension which the mother says has been increasing. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis? B, congenital duodenal atresia? C, Hirschsprung's disease? Or D, annular pancreas? Right here you have a two-week-old who is having episodes of vomiting as well as not passing stools regularly, and they, are, they have abdominal distension. So there are a couple of options here that kind of fit into patients that have vomiting and patients that may have trouble with stooling. And all of these options are actually fair game for that, so it requires you to really uh, knock out a couple of these to determine what the answer is. So when I look at this and see hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, I imagine a baby that was actually normal and then later started to develop uh, this like episodic vomiting, especially right after uh, feeding. And I would imagine that that would not be since the first week of life. For congenital duodenal atresia, you're going to be thinking about similar uh, vomiting and abdominal distension. Um, that's going to be particularly severe at birth. Typically, duodenal atresia is diagnosed in utero. So you would imagine they were a, a baby who had polyhydramnios or a mom who had polyhydramnios um, because they wouldn't be able to have a passage of fluid through the gut, and that would lead to an increase in the amniotic fluid in the uterus. Then at birth, they would have, again, this, this abdominal distension and vomiting. So you, you could see this both, but uh, you kind of look for the, the two findings to be kind of synonymous with something that occurred with this problem in utero. And then additionally, you think about the double bubble sign, which is a radiographic finding, where you'll see two large uh, distensions in the abdomen, um, typically separated by the pylorus when you take an x-ray. So the answer here is actually Hirschsprung's disease, which is a congenital megacolon. It's what occurs, it's, so it's an aganglionic megacolon, which is typically found in the large intestines and you see no ganglion cells in this region to, to promote movement of the, of the colon. So during prenatal development, the cells um, from the neural crest, they typically migrate into the large intestine, uh, and this creates like the, uh, the myenteric plexus, which is the kind of smooth muscle layer of the gastrointestinal wall. And then you have your submucosal plexus, which is made up of the, it's called the Meissner plexus, and uh, that's within the submucosa. In Hirschsprung's disease, you don't have this migration occurring, so the colon lacks the nerve cells uh, in order to, you know, have activity of the colon. Therefore, uh, it can never, like, relax or contract to pass stool normally, and this creates obstructions. In most people affected by the disease, 
uh, it only affects part of their colon. And then in rare cases, it can involve the entire colon. It's pretty rare, one in 5,000 live births. And there is a familial version of the disease that occurs in 10 to 20% of these cases. Many of the times it is genetically related to two main genes are typically found. So the RET gene and the EDNRB gene. Um, when the disorder involves a short segment, you typically see the RET gene, uh, which is on chromosome 10. There is a predisposition to Hirschsprung's disease associated with Down syndrome. Uh, they tend to have it more likely than the general population as well as a, a large number of rare disorders that I actually won't get into because I don't think it's going to be helpful for you. Maybe you may see it in multiple endocrine neoplasia, but I don't think it's worth learning for that purpose. Again, so the, the RET gene is helpful for the coding of proteins that uh, cause this migration of the neural crest cells into the digestive tract as an uh, embryo. And then the EDNRB gene uh, makes proteins that connect nerve cells to the digestive tract uh, and have nerve cell growth there. So either one of those can also cause this problem. Uh, a rare variation uh, of the neuroregulin gene can also cause the disease, and this is seen in a Chinese population as well. So thanks for listening to the episode today. Um, check back this weekend for a practice question rounds uh, powered by stat pearls. Hopefully that'll give you some general content for the boards. Um, I really appreciate you listening. I'm sorry that we had the uh, lapse in our production this week. I was unfortunately just too sick to be producing, but here's an episode now and we'll try to get back on schedule for next week. If you haven't, please subscribe and rate the podcast for us. It's a huge help. If you're really interested in our content, you should check out our app, the Inside the Boards app. It's available on Android and iOS, and it's really the best place to get all of our content. Uh, it's free to use. You just have to set up an account. And if you have a want to get a paid subscription, uh, you can get the All Audio QBank, which can further supplement your studying for the, the board exam. We've been taking down previous episodes of the Study Smarter series, and we're hoping to have them uh, well sorted and in a nice place for you to kind of go through these playlists of them on the app for easier listening. Uh, since we've cataloged those, some of these episodes will be coming off of the actual main podcast uh, in the future. Please take some time to head over to our social media and like us on those share us with some friends who are also studying for the boards. Uh, it's a huge help for them, and uh, we really appreciate your support as we're trying to uh, improve everyone's studying. So good luck this week. Uh, hopefully we'll have some pharmacology material coming up next week that you can listen to and uh, get some good insight from that too. As always, happy studying! Happy studying!